Hi, I'm Jack Howell. When I was a sophomore at the University of Washington, um, I took a psychology class that changed my life. The professor's name was Milton Rokich. I didn't know at the time that he was a heavyweight. But if you were to Google Milton Rokich and the Great American Value Test, I think you'd find some interesting reading. The class was called The Nature of Human Values. It was an upper-level psychology class for majors only that I talked my way into. And, uh, and it was great. I, I could go on and on and on about all of the things that were great about the class. But that would probably about be about the point where the analytics would show me that everyone left the video. Uh, Dr. Rokic was old at the time that we took the, I took the class from him. He was probably 82, something like that. I think he only lived another year after I took his class. And we didn't know if he was going to come in any given day or not. Sometimes a TA would come in and teach the class. But on one particular day, Dr. Rokic came in and sat down behind his desk and he said, Today, we're going to talk about conditioning, okay? He said, who was the 11th president of the United States? And we were silent for a minute, and finally somebody said, Polk. He said, yes, very good, James K. Polk. What's another name for people? We were getting the hang of it by now. We said, folk. He said, very good. What's the white part of an egg? And we all said, yolk. And he said, no, albumin. Do you see how easy it is? I've always said that practicing uh, is one long psychological experiment that we perform on ourselves. Uh, and if you've heard of operant conditioning, you may see where I'm headed with this. It's easy to underestimate just how quickly conditioning occurs. It's very hard to undo it once it's been done. This video is about using the metronome to make your rhythm better, not worse. You may be thinking, I don't, I don't need this. My rhythm is great. You may be right. You're probably right you still might want to consider this with me, if only to eliminate the possibility that you've missed something. People play wrong rhythms because they feel right. That's the whole point. And to date, my career, I've sat on at least 40, maybe 50 audition committees. In every single orchestral audition, some candidates are dismissed primarily because of problems with their rhythm. Bad rhythm is the third rail in orchestral auditions because one fish who can't swim with the other fish wrecks everything. And um, candidates often ask for comments. And I've given comments to some of these players and I've gotten comments after auditions regarding my own rhythm. And a player receiving a rhythm comment might say, well, but I just played for so-and-so, eminent musician, and he, he didn't say anything about my rhythm. Right. So-and-so wasn't on this committee. He didn't hear you on this day. Uh, he didn't hear you with 50 other players back-to-back. -back. And it's not so-and-so's job to make sure that your rhythm is correct. It's yours. Um, but the defensiveness is understandable. Um, a sense of disbelief that anyone would find fault with our rhythm is universal. Um, our rhythm felt perfect to us. That's why we played it that way. And how could we work so hard on something and have it be wrong? Just think about all the hours that we spent with a metronome. So here we go. The metronome. Let's say a student plays rows 32, number 5 in a lesson and does something like this. Okay. 
say to the student, did you practice this with a metronome? And, and if you think this is impossible, you have, you're not a teacher. Uh, anything is possible. Um, some students can mow down a page of 16th notes but get lost in rows 5. That's why Schubert Unfinished is on audition lists. Um, and if you don't think accomplished players can make similar rhythmic mistakes, uh, you haven't sat on enough audition committees. Anyway, I ask if the metronome is used to practice. The student says, of course. I say, okay. Tell me about this. Is that right? The student goes, no. I say, but, but I was with the metronome. How could it be wrong? I was with the metronome. So, QED. Operant conditioning says that behavior followed by satisfying consequences is more likely to be repeated than behavior that is followed by unpleasant consequences. So, how is using a metronome satisfying? Well, um, using a metronome focuses our attention on a stimulus, and focus on any stimulus excludes other stimuli. That absorption is pleasant. Uh, the metronome gives us a sense of virtue and accomplishment simply by the fact that we're using it. And it encourages repetition without giving us any information on whether what we played was correct. In the Rose example, which is not too far off from something that actually happened um, in the last couple of weeks, um, the student either misread the music or guesstimated a rhythm and then practiced the mistake until it felt natural. If it ever felt wrong, a few repetitions with the metronome of assuring them uh, made it feel right. The same thing happens with harmony. Um, a student concentrating on the metronome, going too fast, misses an accidental, doesn't hear it because metronome, and as they say, practice makes permanent. You may be saying to yourself, I couldn't possibly do such a thing. And you may be right, but it's worth considering. Better players make smaller mistakes, but the mistakes are more costly. If you are taking auditions and not getting out of the first round, I'm not saying, just saying. And at the risk of belaboring the point, I'm going to expand on it. Our ability to focus, our ability to pay attention, is finite. If you're up for some fun on your own time, find a magician and ask him to tell you how misdirection works. Uh, there's a book by Keith Code called The Soft Science of Motorcycle Road Racing. And in the book, he says, we have a dollar's worth of attention. That's it. If we overspend, we crash. And I think that attention dollar is a useful concept. Lots of things cost attention. Cell phones, relationship issues, existential crisis. But let's assume for the moment that we have a whole dollar's worth of attention available to practice a difficult new passage. If playing the correct notes in the correct rhythm on the clarinet costs 80 cents of our attention, Setting the metronome to a tempo that costs 50 cents will result in mistakes. Then we will probably repeat them, and so we'll become unaware of them. Now, doesn't it make sense to play the passage correctly, slowly, until it needs only 30 cents of attention to play? That gives us plenty of attention to spend on increasing speed. Of course it makes sense. Why don't we do it? Well, habit. Students often are encouraged to run before they can walk, and they form the habit of spewing mistakes at a fast tempo rather than playing beautifully and correctly at a slower tempo. This habit can persist in some form, to some degree, long after we know better. 
Habits die hard, but we really, really want to break this one, and we want to create a new habit of prioritizing clarity over tempo and trusting that tempo will come. And if you're at this point, you may find that simply holding the clarinet triggers the habit of, of playing before you've completely thought something through, uh, of the habit of firing the missile before you've aimed it. So to form this new habit, you may need to put the clarinet down. And we do this in, in lessons. Uh, when a student plays something like, uh, like a wrong rhythm in number five, we put the clarinet on the peg, and we conduct, and we vocalize. I'm not really worried about pitch so much as I am worried about having a sense of motion and about being able to conduct to the metronome and do what we want to do musically and do it correctly. So we'll go. It goes to one and a three, four, one. Da 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 di, ya da 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 di. And so forth. So as we as we as we conduct, um, um, we we want to make sure that we distribute the rhythm throughout the phrase smoothly. We want to make rhythm and phrasing two sides of the same coin. And without the distraction of the clarinet, we can think. I ask students to be expressive, both in how they vocalize and how they conduct. Um, I ask students to feel the space within a bar and how the music fills that space. I ask students to articulate clearly and to, uh, to show fine rhythmic distinctions, um, like uh, a duple pickup to a triplet in a Brahms sonata. Uh, we organize rhythm according to where it goes, not how long we wait. We avoid uh, mistaking emphasis for precision. Da, uh, um, we eliminate unintended accents, like uh, at the ends of ties. Da, 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 da. Um, and the metronome merely guides our conducting, keeps us on track, while the rhythm be remains where it belongs, in our minds, in, in our muscles. The student who correctly, musically vocalizes while conducting now has a clear mental image and can build speed and steadiness. And it's pretty amazing the improvement that uh, students can make when they think before they play. Um, I encourage students to make a habit of conducting and singing any new piece of music on their own before they bring it to a lesson and I get all up in their grill about it. And I find that those who make basic mistakes in lessons have usually skipped this step. And by the time we're done fixing the mistake, they agree that forming a clear mental image is a better use of time than breaking a bad habit. <clears throat> those preparing for auditions might consider doing the same thing. Just because something feels right doesn't mean it is right. And uh, speaking of steadiness, assuming that using a metronome will automatically develop the ability to hold a steady tempo is also a mistake. The player who parses rhythm correctly but reacts to each individual click that just happened rather than anticipating the rhythm's destination and using the metronome just to maintain a pulse is not developing good rhythm. This kind of player is always correcting, either slightly behind or slightly ahead, never completely settled in the tempo, and often playing unintended accents in, in an attempt to, uh, to land exactly on the beat. This is not necessarily a rookie mistake. Um, it's possible for rhythmically reactive players to do it well enough to enjoy some success. But it's not ideal. Uh, someone making constant corrections, even small ones, creates tension in an ensemble. Think of a dog 
walking on a leash. On one hand, we have a well-trained dog walking at heel, uh, exactly at the human's pace. The leash is slack. Both walkers are relaxed. On the other hand, there's the dog who's always lunging ahead or lagging behind with the human alternately hauling back or dragging forward on the leash. Nobody is relaxed, and if this were a musical ensemble, it would be falling apart. Right, so I exaggerate. I exaggerate to make the point that there is a big difference between playing with the pulse and reacting to the beat. The reactive player is reinforcing a bad habit and becoming increasingly unaware of an extremely annoying way of playing while feeling accurate and accomplished because metronome. Um, if you want to test your ability in this respect, um, you can put your metronome on half tempo, just have a slower pulse. Um, for duples and for triples, you put it at one third, and then just try and, and keep the, the allegro tempo or whatever the tempo is, but with a longer pulse. Um, now, Please note, I am not saying that metronomes are bad or that you shouldn't use one. A metronome is a massively useful tool for enforcing slow, super accurate practice. Um, when you get a piece of music and there's a metronome marking, you, yeah, you better turn on the metronome and, and see what you've got to do. Um, and when you're working on fundamental technique, uh, you want a metronome just like a sprinter wants a stopwatch. You want to know how fast your, your articulation is. You want to know how fast you can play your scales evenly. Just make sure not to sacrifice quality and beauty for speed. And that's it. Uh, make the metronome serve the music, not the other way around. This kind of thinking has applications beyond music. It's not a matter of perfectionism. It's a matter of figuring out how to avoid making extra work for yourself and winding up with a better result in the process. As they say, measure twice, cut once. If you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing. In a future video, I will demonstrate the most demanding, frustrating, exasperating but also the most effective metronome drill I've ever used. I credit it as largely responsible for my current employment. Go get them.